Our speaker is with us, David Ramsey Steele. And we uh, without any further ado, then we will hear from our speaker, David Ramsey Clark. Steele. Name to the Attorney General. I'm not Ramsey Clark, I'm Ramsey Steele. Well, <clears throat> fellow members of the human species, uh, and anybody else who may be paying attention. Uh, I've spoken here several times before on different topics, very, a bright, great variety of topics. I never thought I would speak about uh, the global warming issue, but I've changed my mind in the last few months. Um, part of the reason for that is I have something very interesting to say, and that is I am going to confidently predict with very high confidence, as the IPCC uh, assessment reports would say, that 10 years from now, it will all be over. Uh, we will all, everybody in this room who's still around, will look back on this as a delusion which uh, people had to go through and which they have abandoned. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to explain my reasons for that, for thinking that. <clears throat> The other thing, a couple of other things that uh, induced me to uh, talk about this topic was that when I've occasionally mentioned it in passing, um, in talks I've given here on different uh, subjects, uh, I've sometimes mentioned some very elementary fact uh, to be greeted with hoots of incredulous derision. Uh, so I do think people need a bit of educating in some elementary facts. Another thing is that people ask me, uh, after hearing some of my presentations here, and knowing my, my, what, that I'm a skeptic about global warming, they said, when are you going to come and talk about that? So, uh, in response to this um, overwhelming popular demand, I eventually reluctantly agreed, and that's what I'm going to talk about. Now, <clears throat> there is a handout, there, there's a few handouts that I prepared, and a couple of them are just articles that I thought might be of interest, but one of them is what I'm going to concentrate on. It's an outline of what I'm going to concentrate on for the next few minutes, and that's the basic facts in the global warming debate. Because I find repeatedly when I talk to people that they're unaware of these basic facts. Uh, the first thing that you need to know is that there are four propositions that everybody agrees with, or everybody I can't speak for all 7 billion people on the planet, but almost everybody agrees to. And I've set them out here. Um, and skeptics, and I've talked to hundreds of climate skeptics and read thousands of them, skeptics accept these four propositions just as much as the people I'm going to call catastrophists accept these four propositions. Number one, Global mean surface temperature, in other words, the average temperature on the Earth, measured day and night, all months of the year. Um, <clears throat> has risen over the past couple of hundred years by about one degree Celsius. Uh, second, because of industrial activity, human-caused emissions of carbon dioxide have increased, and the increase became really noticeable around 1950, when many industrial economies picked up and many uh, new, newly uh, industrialized economies started to expand their output. So there's been a fairly steady increase in carbon dioxide emissions by industry since about 1950. Number three, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and that means this stuff here that we breathe and that is all around us, uh, has risen, and it's risen by about 35% to what it is now, which is about 400 ppm, parts per million by volume, which is 400 millionths, or 0 0.0004, or 0.04%, or four ten thousandths of the atmosphere. Now, in a room like this where people are talking and getting excited because I'm saying such outrageous things, 
uh, the level of carbon dioxide will go up a bit. So it's probably going to go up to 500 parts per million uh, in the course of the next hour or so. Um, but that's what carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has risen to, 400 par uh, parts per million by volume. The fourth proposition, number four, is that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas which, under very simplified assumptions, if doubled, would raise the global mean surface temperature by one degree Celsius. So those propositions, you can take it from me, are accepted by everybody, almost everybody. Uh, I go online and look at what people are saying. Very, very rarely I find I found somebody who's disagreed with one of these propositions, very rarely. Um, and they, I usually find, when I pursue it, that they're new to the discussion, they're just learning, or they're objecting on pedantic grounds. For instance, I've heard some people say, oh, there is no greenhouse effect, uh, because they've read what Al Gore says about the greenhouse effect, and of course that's all wrong scientifically. It's not the way scientists describe the greenhouse effect. Um, and it's not what goes on in greenhouses. Uh, it's what we used to think went on in greenhouses. But there is a greenhouse. Um, and um, skeptics don't dispute that there is a greenhouse effect. Now, if these four propositions are all agreed upon by climate skeptics, uh, where is the disagreement? Where, why do people like me and why do people like several hundred outstanding climate scientists uh, disagree with the majority view uh, on uh, <coughs> anthropogenic human cause global warming. Well, <coughs> the distinctive feature of the catastrophist view is that positive feedbacks will amplify the one degree warming directly caused by a doubling of CO2 to as much as three degrees Celsius or more. In other words, Catastrophists claim that climate sensitivity is high. Climate sensitivity is the response of mean surface temperature to an increase in the quantity of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Climate skeptics say that in all likelihood, climate sensitivity is low less than 2 degrees, and in most cases, there's a range of views, and in most cases, less than 1.5 degrees. Now, that's the point at issue, climate sensitivity. If anybody wants to talk to you about something else when you're talking about the science of global warming, they're taking you away from the real subject at issue. Um, notice, by the way, that that proposition, that climate sensitivity is high, is not basic physics. The greenhouse effect is basic physics, but the high climate sensitivity is not basic physics. It's an uncorroborated speculation. Now, there's nothing wrong with uncorroborated speculations. That's how science make, makes progress. First you have a guess, and then you test it, and then you refute it, and then you move on. And that's what's happening. So when catastrophists in the media, and despite what you heard in that little commercial, uh, before I got up to speak, um, you, you're well aware of the fact that uh, the catastrophists have a lock hold on the media. Um, when catastrophists in the media repeatedly emphasize those points one through four, they are reiterating what is not in dispute. Now, this, there's two possible explanations for why they do that. One is that they, they haven't bothered to read what climate skeptics say, and they don't know what they say. The other is a handy little debating trick to distract attention from the only issue that really matters, climate sensitivity. Is it high or is it low? Now, <clears throat> there's some other important facts. First of all, evidence keeps coming in every month or so, and I'm not exaggerating when I say every month or so. If you're interested in what scientists are saying in published peer-reviewed papers about any topic, well, what most people do is they go online, they see a reference to the paper, they Google that paper, and it usually takes them to a link to the paper, or at least an abstract with an invitation to buy the paper, one of the two. 
But you can go to Science Direct, which is a service offered by Elsevier Publishing, which has 13 million scientific papers constantly expanding at a huge exponential rate. Uh, and you can put in whatever you're interested in. It might be climate sensitivity, it might be medieval warm period, any topic. And you will get a large list of um, scientific papers, published scientific papers on that topic, beginning with the most recent. Uh, and you can do that. Um, so when I say it's every month or so, I'm not exaggerating. Uh, every month or so, <coughs> you get a new scientific paper arguing that climate sensitivity is low. The most recent is the Lewis and Curry paper, uh, which appeared in Climate Dynamics on the 25th of September, just a few days ago. Now, that's actually, I should say, that's a very exceptional paper because it's by two leading climate skeptic scientists, Judith Curry and Nicholas Lewis, both of them very, very eminent scientists in this field who are climate skeptics. Uh, that's not what you usually find. What you usually find is a paper where the, the authors put in a couple of lines about how we all know that global warming is true, right? They put that in because they want a quiet life. They're not, by nature, disposed to public controversy. They want to keep their jobs and they want to keep their funding. But the actual conclusions of their paper is that climate sensitivity is low. So part of my thesis in what I'm telling you tonight is that the evidence is building up against catastrophism. Scientific evidence keeps coming against catastrophes. Now, second basic fact, and another important fact apart from the ones I mentioned, is that the recent rise in temperature, which began a couple of hundred years ago, was well underway long before human emissions of carbon dioxide were of any significance. So, it's generally accepted that they only became of significance in 1950. Uh, but the rise in temperature began in 1850. Sorry, you got your dinner, right? Yeah, I need iced tea. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Another important fact you need to know is that when that rise in temperature began in 1850, yes. it was at the end of the coldest period in recent Earth history, but the coldest period in the last thousand years, known as the Little Ice Age. We're still coming out of the Little Ice Age. We still haven't reached the temperature of the medieval warm period. Now, I should say at this point that some catastrophists have recently taken to denying that there was a Little Ice Age or that there was a medieval warm period. I'm, I'm going to discuss that briefly a bit later. So the next point I'm going to make would be contested by a few catastrophists. The temperature was warmer than today in the medieval warm period, roughly 950 to 1250. It was warmer than that in the Roman warm period, 400 to 200 BC or BCE as we might say. It was even warmer than that in the Minoan warm period, 1300 to 1100 BCE. And even warmer than that in the Holocene optimum, 6000 uh, BC to 4500 BC, BCE. Now, one thing you'll notice about that is that polar bears existed before the Holocene optimum. And they survived all these warm periods that were much warmer than today. And that's the same is true of many life forms that are said to be endangered by current warming. <coughs> is the Earth warming or cooling? Well, the correct answer is it's cooling. If we look at the last 10,000 years, which is a mere speck of time in the history of the Earth, the first 5,000 of those 10,000 years were, on average, much, much warmer than the second 5,000 of those 10,000 years. And by far the coldest thousand year period of those 10 is the one that we've just ended. The last thousand years is the coldest thousand year period of the last 10,000 years. 
So over a time scale of thousands of years, global temperature has been falling. And that's exactly what we should expect. Why should we expect that? Because we're coming to the end of an interglacial. We're about to enter a new period of glaciation. I say we're about to. It might not happen for 5,000 years. It might not happen for 10,000 years. It might take longer. Nobody knows for certain. The timing is not precise enough to predict. But we are, in, we are coming to the end of an interglacial. No geologist will dispute this. And about to enter a new period of glaciation. Now, just to mention a few facts about that, one thing to bear in mind is that the period of glaciation, by the way, there is a difference between scientific terminology and popular terminology here. Among geologists, we're in an ice age and we've been in an ice age for the past 65 million years. They don't talk about entering an ice age or leaving it. We're in an ice age. Um, but in popular terminology, what geologists call a glaciation is often referred to as an ice age. Now you have to remember that the period of glaciation lasts about ten times as long as the interglacial. So the interglacial lasts about ten thousand years. The next uh, glaciation lasts for about a hundred thousand years. It, it's irregular. It's not per this is not a perfect the time thing, but this is the pattern, been the pattern for many tens of millions of years. <clears throat> and when we say a period of glaciation, you have to understand what that means. It means that North America will be like Greenland. It means that where we are sitting now will be, be beneath several miles of ice. The Earth has not fully rebounded it's not fully sprang back into place, sprung back into place, since the last glaciation. It never does between glaciations. The Earth is still rebounding. And then the new glaciation comes, and this terrible weight of ice comes. There will be no North America, except for a few little villages around Florida, <laughs> uh, in, for 100,000 years when the glaciation gets going. And we're sinking into that quite inevitably. Unless you think that the pattern of the past 65 million years is suddenly, miraculously going to change, maybe it will. I don't know. Another of the basic facts you need to understand is that we're in a, in a very interesting little period, in a very, I've just been talking about very long time scales, um, <clears throat> looking at very short time scales, there has been no increase in mean global surface temperature for the past several years. Now, you see different figures banded about, and that's because the measurement of mean global surface temperature comes from various different places. There's about seven or eight that are reputable, and they all give slightly different results. They're broadly consistent. There's no question that they're measuring something uh, they're broadly consistent, but they, they differ in slight detail. Uh, but it's at least 10 years. There has been no increase in mean global surface temperature for at least 10 years. Some people say 20 years or more, but at least 10 years. It has not increased. And this is uh, something that very tr much troubles the catastrophists. They react to it in various ways. When it first started, they denied it was happening. After all, you can draw a line through a, gra through a graph, a trend line, uh, and you can ignore little fluctuations. You can say, well, just a little fluctuation, we're still increasing. And then, after a few years, they agreed it was happening, but they said, well, it can't happen for much longer. Wait a year or two, and you'll see a huge spike in global temperature. We're wrong again. Just recently, they were hoping for... A, <laughs> it's interesting I say hoping, because of course, um, they claim to be afraid of warming, and I'm sure they, sincere, they sincerely are. Uh, but we all actually love our theories more than we love reality. Because our theories are our only hold on reality. People fall in love with their theories and they fight like crazy to keep to their theories. So they were hoping that the 
that there would be an El Nino this year, and that it would be a super duper one like the one in 1979, and it would push, <laughs> push well temperatures up, but it doesn't look as though that's going to happen. El Ninos, by the way, are notoriously difficult to predict. Um, even right, at, even a, a, a few months before they fully blossom out, you can't really say for certain what, what's going to happen. So it doesn't look as though the pause, as it's called, the, the pause in increase of mean global surface temperature, it doesn't look as though that's going to end anytime soon. Now, skeptical climate scientists. Uh, that's a mixed bag. There are different views. Not all of them say this, but some of them say that we're in for another 20 or 30 years of cooling. And there have been periods of 20 years of cooling over the last couple of hundred years, but they've then been more than cancelled out by an increasing warming. So the warming that we've seen in the past couple of hundred years is net. There have been periods of cooling followed by periods of warming, gradually increasing. Next important point, Earth's climate never stops changing. There is no such thing, and never has been any such thing, and never will be any such thing, as an unchanging Earth climate. The idea that we should prevent climate change is seriously uninformed. Climate always changes. In addition to longer term trends, like the, the ice age trends, the glaciation and the interglacials, so the current long term trend is a cooling trend, the, the climate is subject to cyclical processes. And these may be decades or they may be centuries. And the, the, we know there are some of these, and we've given names to them, uh, but a lot is not known. And they combine in various ways. Now, <clears throat> these cyclical processes mostly involve ocean currents. Remember that the, the hydrosphere, the oceans, are bigger than the atmosphere. Uh, and they are a, a very important part of any developments in the climate and the temperature of the Earth. So there are these processes. So without any carbon dioxide, without any other uh, peculiar interventions or forcings, you're going to get fluctuations in climate of the, of the type we've seen over the past 500 years. You're going to see that, whatever. Nothing can stop it. Uh, and um, in that perspective, what's gone on for the warming, the net warming of the last 200 years is not at all exceptional, is not at all uh, unusual, historically, it's not something that calls for a special explanation. Yes. It's within the range of natural variability. Now, another important point, evidence has accumulated that the sun's activity changes in the sun's activity have importance for the Earth's climate. In other words, what happens to the sun, which is not fixed, it's fluctuating, it goes through cycles of its own, has effects on Earth's climate. Now, climate, let me tell you this, Skeptical climate scientists are divided on this issue, considerably divided. Some of them say there is no monocausal driver of climate. It's not carbon dioxide, it's not the sun. Others have bought this idea that the sun's changing activity is very important. But there is an, inter there's an interesting asymmetry here. If you think that the sun is important for the Earth's climate, then you have to believe that climate sensitivity is low. That's inesc that inescapably follows. Because if a major part of the changes we've seen in Earth's climate are due to changes in the sun's activity, there is, the arithmetic just doesn't allow room for high climate sensitivity as a response to carbon dioxide. 
Another important fact you should know is that considerable scientific evidence supports the view that modest temperature increase, at least up to 2 degrees Celsius from where we are now, would be net beneficial for human beings and for the environment. One other thing I haven't got down on my basic important points there, um, <clears throat> that I should mention, is that each additional increment of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has less effect than the previous increment. Uh, and it, it works out to be roughly like a logarithm. In other words, you double carbon dioxide and you get a certain increase in temperature according to the greenhouse effect. You double it again and you get that same increase, not twice as much, because it's like a logarithm. It, it's quickly um, tapering off. Now, <clears throat> on the next sheet on this, uh, on this handout that I hope you're all looking at, uh, there's, a, there's a graph. And it shows global temperature, 1978 to 2013. And I put the graph there twice so that you can see what I'm responsible for. The graph at the top and the graph, the graph at the bottom is different only in that I've scribbled on it. And you see that I've drawn attention to the pores. You can see that that's flat, can't you? No, uh, <clears throat> anybody here who knows how to read a graph. Now, if you went through a Chicago public school, you may not know how to read a graph. But uh, if you didn't go through a Chicago public school, then you know how to read a graph. And you can see that that's flat, right? Okay. Uh, before, the, before the pause, that's called the pause. Actually, it's a very biased way to refer to it because it suggests that we all know that warming is going to resume. We don't know that. The pause could be followed by cooling. But they, that's become the term, the pause or the hiatus. And it's discussed at length in the latest um, I, IPCC assessment report. There's a whole chapter devoted to, or almost a whole chapter, many pages, where they discuss the pause. And it seriously troubles them. They don't know. There are many different explanations they've come up with. Um, it shows the super El Nino which was around 1978, and it shows the period of rapid warming, rapid by comparison, before that. Now, if you look at a graph like this, there's a few things you need to know, right? Just a few things. First of all, this is typical of graphs that you're shown. Uh, and there's nothing sinister about this, it's just how to interpret the graph, right? Um, <clears throat> these, these, these graphs don't show actual temperatures. They never do. What they show is what's called the anomaly. Um, that means two things, <coughs> you know, bear in mind. Zero is not zero Celsius. Zero is a reference period, a 30-year reference period in the recent past. Um, <clears throat> so if the zero was zero Celsius, then we would have frozen to death <laughs> in this warming period, right? Uh, the actual... The actual um, global mean surface temperature is somewhere around uh, 14 degrees Celsius, 57 degrees Fahrenheit. It's not, it doesn't go below zero. We'd all be dead. Um, <clears throat> the, other, the other important thing about the anomaly is that it's calculated monthly. And what that means is it, it screens out monthly changes in temperature. Now, the temperature of the Earth goes up every March by more than one degree Celsius. The temperature of the Earth increases every March by an amount greater than it's increased in the last 200 years. In fact, the temperature of the Earth fluctuates through a range for more than four times that amount every year. Right? It goes up, it comes down. Anybody want to know why it goes up and comes down? Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's a natural question. Since people think, well, 
when it's cold in the north, it's warm in the south, and when it's warm in the north, it's cold in the south. So it should all even out, and there shouldn't be big fluctuations. The fundamental reason why you do get these big fluctuations is there's much more water. By the way, footnote, when I say water, I mean water. Okay? Because I grew up on this little island off the coast of Europe where they speak very strangely. Water. I'm going to say water from now on. There's much more water in the Southern Hemisphere than there is in the Northern Hemisphere. So in the Southern Hemisphere, there's 20% land and 80% water. In the Northern Hemisphere, there's 60% land and 60% water and 40% land. And that makes all the difference because water has the extraordinary property of having an extremely high specific heat capacity. It takes a lot of energy to, to warm up water. And, it, and when you warm it up, it stays warm for a much, lot longer than other substances do. A wash pot never boils, right? So, dramatic changes in the Earth's temperature seem, uh, this is simplifying it a lot, but tend to emanate from the, the land surface, which is mostly in the northern hemisphere. So you get these big fluctuations every year in the... Uh, <clears throat> global mean surface temperature. Much bigger than these long term. So what they do with the anomaly is they screen that out. Is this a devious plot? No. It's perfectly reasonable. What you're trying to do is you're trying to arrange the data in such a way that they display what you're looking for. You screen out what you're not interested in. Uh, and that's what they do. The other thing you should notice about a graph like this is the very small range we're looking at. We're looking at tenths of a degree here. That's something, the, the, the temperature changes within a few minutes on a typical day by more than this. Um, these are very minute changes that we're looking at. Now, turning over the page, and you can see that <coughs> Again, this is the, 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 the same basic information, but going back to 1850. And you, again, I've scribbled on the bottom one so that you can look at the top one without being biased by what I'm telling you. And there's a very special significance in this graph. Uh, can someone tell me what it is? 1850 to the present day. This is the entire thermometer record. 1850 to the present day is the entire thermometer record. So when you hear somebody saying, this was the warmest decade on record, what they mean is, it's the warmest decade. Some, they sometimes say that and it's not true, but when they say it and it's true, or even if it's not, what it means is it's the warmest decade since 1850. That's all it means. Uh, what about before 1850? Well, there are some temperature records, but they, they can't claim to be global. There were none in the Southern Hemisphere, for example, before 1850. We, do, we look at temperature differently before 1850. We look at it by looking at proxies, and that's looking at ice cores, tree rings, all kinds of, um, all kinds of evidence of what the temperature was. At different, and geologists have been doing this for over a century. They've been pinning down what the temperature was at different points uh, in the Earth's history. So you can see that um, there was a cooling period, uh, roughly from uh, around about 1940 to 1970, was a cooling period. Now, how do the catastrophes explain that, since it was a period when carbon dioxide emissions were rapidly increasing? And remember that because there was less carbon dioxide in the atmosphere then, it was having a bigger effect than it does now, even though there's more of it now. Because the increase you would expect to have a bigger effect. Well, the way they explain it is by aerosols. Industrial activity creates carbon dioxide, but it also creates fine particles which get into the atmosphere. The atmosphere gets more dust, if you like, although they can be finer than you would normally consider dust, or they can even be combinations of gases that get to a certain density. And the general view is that aerosols, these fine particles, um, have a cooling effect. 
So the catastrophist view, the IPCC view, that uh, the IPCC is the high church of catastrophism, um, their explanation for that cruelty uh, after 1940 is that aerosols were outweighing the effect of carbon dioxide. Right? Now, it's rather difficult. It, actually, there again, it's being undermined by research, because you could, these are all things you can research directly. It's easy to say aerosols have this effect, but that can be studied. You can actually go out and measure the effect. And what results have come in suggest that the effect of aerosols is not very great. <coughs> I should say additional aerosols, because the, the air is full of aerosols anyway. Um, but anyway, it can't, it, that can't explain the pause. Aerosols can't explain the pause. There has been no in, great increase in uh, creation of aerosols in the period of the pause. So, um, the final sheet in this little package is, um, just shows you some of the changes in global temperature. It shows the uh, Minoan warming, the Roman warming, the medieval warming. Now, I should caution you, although it, this, this graph makes my case look very good, this is just Greenland. Uh, <coughs> what do the numbers on the right mean? I can't figure that out. But then again, I went to a Chicago school, so... <laughs> I have to think about that. I haven't thought about that. Well, it, 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 it's, it, it's temperature, right? Um, temperature of what? And it's going down, or it goes... I'll tell you in a minute. Um, but... Um, it goes down, it says it's going to get warmer. This, this is just Greenland. So the actual global would be, would be much less dramatic than this, because the Southern Hemisphere tends to moderate changes going on in the Northern Hemisphere. So, um, those are some of the basic facts. And the, the thing, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a climate scientist, right? I mean, uh, but I am, I think of myself as a belief scientist. All my life I've been interested in why people believe things. And why they stop believing things. Um, why they stop going to church why they start going to church. That's, that's the sort of thing that interests me. Why they join the Communist Party? Why they jo join the Fascist Party? Um, so I'm interested in belief systems. But, of course, you have to remember with beliefs, beliefs have a relation. Beliefs, if they're about matters of fact, are true or false. And that's a matter of what's going on in the real world, independent of the beliefs. Right? So... If you're going to look at belief systems in relation to any area, you have to have some idea of the facts in that area, which is why I spent that introductory period looking at some of those basic facts. Um, <clears throat> well, catastrophism, climate catastrophism, seems to be a tremendously high level of zeal and passion right at the moment. Um, just a few days ago, Robert Kennedy Jr. Uh, said that uh, climate skeptics, or I think he said deniers, uh, should be jailed. And a few months ago, uh, a professor of music at the University of Graz in, in Austria, um, whose name is Richard Palmcott, um, argued that uh, climate deniers should be executed. <laughs> um, well, they haven't caught up with me yet, I'm still here. Um, but I'm, despite this, I think this is just before the collapse. I predict with confidence, with very high confidence, that this belief system is uh, of catastrophism is going to crash and burn. And you, in 10 years' time, it will be something <coughs> like cold fusion. Anyway. Uh, it will be something like the Y2K Millennium Bug. It was something we look back on and we say, well, how could people believe in that? Um, <clears throat> so let me say a few things about beliefs. People are born with an appetite to believe. They try to make sense of the world, and that means they believe things about the world, which explain the world to them. If you have any doubts about that, I would strongly recommend that you read... Uh -huh a book by Alison Plotnick called The Scientist in the Crib, and it's how little babies, just a few weeks old, are forming theories about the world. 
and revising these theories in the light of their experience. Acting on their theories and then abandoning them when experience shows to them that those theories are no good and they have to move on to another theory, just like science does. So we believe, we believe things, we accept systems of belief. We interpret data in terms of our theory. So if, you, if you're wedded to um, a system of belief, other people may have objections that you brush aside as irrelevant. This is doesn't matter whether you whether you what your belief is. This is neutral. It applies to all beliefs. You interpret your observations in terms of your theory. You know when Pasteur put forward his revised the theory and and and. Uh, reworked it and represented the theory that germs cause disease. Um, there were lots of very common sense ways of dismissing that as obviously wrong. You know, people said, for example, um, there are lots of people who are exposed to the same germs, and only a few of them become sick, or only a percentage of them become sick. Some become sick and some don't. So obviously, the germs are not important, right? Well, that's a common sense argument. But the people who understood what Pasteur was telling them about these microscopic organisms um, saw things differently. They brushed that aside as irrelevant. So things that seem irrelevant to people outside a belief system seem very relevant to people within that belief system. They look at the world differently. A lot of physicists, Newtonian physicists, died without ever accepting Einstein. Um, <clears throat> And we're emotionally attached to our theories. We fall in love with our theories. And just as love is blind, so we become blind to the shortcomings of our theories. This is, applies to all theories, true and false. It's not, I'm not saying this just about climate catastrophism. It's true of climate skepticism. It's true of communism. It's true of liberalism. Now... <clears throat> So that's a fact about human beings. They're prone to join up in the army of some belief system and then fight to the death for that belief system. This is what human beings are like. This is what they do. It's something hardwired by their genes. They have to do that. Now, <clears throat> in roughly the years of the 1960s and 1970s, there was a big change in what we call the left. Prior to the Second World War, you could definitely say that the left was in favor of economic growth and technology. There were a few little uh, dissenters from that. But the left was pro-technology and pro-economic growth. They wanted the good things in life to be produced by modern industry for the masses. By the 1980s, that's not true. The left is opposed to economic growth and it's opposed to technology. It wants to shut it down. Um, for a whole complex of reasons. So the left changed. It became against technology, against progress, against economic growth. Oh, no, I wouldn't say that. Um, the progressives turned against progress. I'm in favor of progress. Progress, you would say, in this continent. But it's the same thing. Um, <clears throat> So, the, so then you get the growth of environmentalism and its most uh, extreme manifestation of greenism. Now, notice what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that there's something wrong with science being influenced by ideas from outside science. I'm not saying that at all. Um, that's bound to happen, and it's in itself harmless. Um, <clears throat> The guy, the, the guy who thought of the Big Bang Theory, Lemaitre, was an astrophysicist who also happened to be a Roman Catholic priest. I don't know whether his theology caused him to favor a sudden beginning to the universe, but certainly, once he'd done it, the Vatican was very impressed and they kept hosting conferences about uh, cosmology because they loved the idea that they were vindicated because the universe had begun at a certain point. What, has, what does that tell us about the truth or falsity of the Big Bang Theory? Absolutely nothing. 
You can get ideas from anywhere. That doesn't tell you whether they're true or false. The way you determine whether they're true or false is by testing them, which is by working out the implications of them, doing observations, and seeing whether they comply with the observations. So, there have been cases, of course, where ideas from our science have taken over science, and the most notorious case, I suppose, is Lysenkoism. Lysenko was uh, a botanist of sorts in Stalin's Russia, who is essentially thought that by conditioning plants, you could get them to grow in different conditions. Thank you. Uh, okay. And <coughs> that meant rejecting genetics. Well, so Lysenkoism rejected genetics. Now, in the 30s, communists members of the Communist Party were obliged to believe in Lysenkoism. Uh, and uh, in Russia, they were shot if they didn't. Right? Um, and um, that's an example of science being taken over by a non-scientific idea. Now, there's nothing wrong with scientists being influenced by ideas from politics. And here we have the idea that the environment is everything and the genes are nothing or the environment is a lot more than Mendel says it is, anyway. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. What was wrong with Lysenkoism? What was wrong with it? Well, what was wrong was the shutting down of debate. The fact that people who, in the Soviet Union, who criticized Lysenkoism were shot, and people in the Western Communist parties, the big Communist parties in the West, like in France and Italy, uh, were expelled and, and then harassed. Um, <clears throat> Because it's not the fact that science, some scientists are influenced in their ideas by non-scientific ideas. Um, it's the fact that they try to shut down debate. That's what's the problem. Theoretically, that could lead to the end of science. Now, of course, it's not going to lead to the end of science in the next couple of hundred years. Science is going to survive, and that's one of the reasons for thinking that global warming catastrophism will be abandoned. It will crash and burn very soon. Now, you can see this environmentalist movement, which is a political movement driven by political zealotry, uh, casting around for some issue. And you have to understand that from the point of view of the environmentalists, uh, it's, not good, it's not good at all to have a, th a problem that can be fixed. What you need is a problem that cannot be fixed without destroying modern industry. So... The hole in the ozone layer was something they made something of for a while. But that's, the particular substances were being emitted, they could be stopped without any great cost. So that was something that wasn't good enough. Um, <coughs> there was acid rain, remember that? Um, the thing about acid rain and the way it was presented by the environmentalists of the time, the Greens of the time, uh, was that it was the death of the world's forests. Acid rain was destroying the world's forests. Well, what happened then was, um, I'm not saying that there's nothing harmful whatsoever about acid rain. I'm not saying that nothing should be done about it. But however, it did not kill the world's forests. And what, as reports kept coming in, it became clear that the world's forests were in great shape, except the ones that were cut down in some parts of the world. But uh, as far as acid rain went, the world's forests were, were taking it all um, with, uh, with a great calm and, and collected uh, superiority. They were surviving and flourishing. Um, so uh, one, there was a point where we used to hear about acid rain every day on the media, constantly, and then it stopped. Why did it stop? Well, it stopped because global warming came along. Oh, so they took salt from um, <coughs> That's what they did. <laughs> now... <coughs> Environmentalism has become a major uh, lobby in our society. Um, they, uh, they managed to greatly curtail nuclear power. Um, and so as a result of their curtailing nuclear power, there was a great increase in reliance on fossil fuels. Um, <clears throat> so if it were true that fossil fuels, by emitting carbon dioxide, were posing a great threat to the planet, uh, then the environmentalists would uh, bear some share of the responsibility. 
because they uh, orchestrated this political movement to curtail nuclear power. Um, <coughs> now, another, uh, what I'm leading up to here is that what, we're, what we witnessed with, with climate catastrophism is an ideological perfect storm. You've got all these things going on. Uh, you have the left turning against economic growth and technology. You have the, the scares, the successive scares, which nearly always turn out to be either completely un, un, unfounded or else greatly overblown. Um, after billions of dollars have been spent on, on them. Um, Something else that was happening at the same time was a change in the cultural situation of science. Now, 50 years ago, if you asked a, a, a media person, such as a journalist or newspaper reporter, what they thought of scientists, they would say, huh, they're no good for a story. Because if you ask them anything, they either answer in mathematical gobbledygook, or they qualify everything, or they say something we can't make any sense of. They, we can't get a headline out. It's impossible. Now it's different. Now, the young research scientist, one of the things he learns, and it's nearly always a he, um, one of the things he learns is you pick a topic to research and you keep an eye on how it can be spun. You usually have a mentor, and your mentor is himself a research scientist, a bit older, who controls the funding for a project, and he wants to get your project approved. So, for example, let's say that um, let's say that you're very interested in studying uh, the habits of a slug that lives in the Rocky Mountains, <laughs> and you go and you present this proposal to your mentor, your supervisor, uh, and he said, "Well, that's that's all very good, uh, but." Um, What would happen to this slug if the, uh, if the mean global surface temperature rose by a few degrees centigrade? Uh, never thought of that. So it goes away and works it out. Well, it would actually, it would be one that do wonders for this slug. It would flourish like crazy. So, well, what if what if it um, what if the, the the global mean surface temperature went up by 20 degrees? What would happen to it? Oh, well, it'd be in trouble. Okay, we can put that in your paper, and we'll put that in your in in the uh, proposal. Um, <coughs> for funding for your, for your research project. Now, it needn't be global warming. It could be AIDS or cancer. It could be any hot, really hot button issue, but right at the top at the moment is global warming. So this innocent uh, research scientist who didn't mean to do anything wrong um, <coughs> ends up, a few years later, having been funded. Um, he writes, his, writes up his results. And what happens? Well, there's a press release from his department, a press release, with, you know, and the press release has a headline, and headlines all about global warming. And if you read the paper itself, uh, this reference to global warming is like footnote 32 on page 57, right? This is real. This is what's happening now. This is what's happening now in science. Um, in fact, I've looked at many of these, and I've looked at cases where What's in the press release isn't in the research paper at all. Now, how did it get in there? If it's not in the research paper at all, well, I don't know for certain, but I'm guessing. The mentor, the guy who's in effect the employer and the conduit for funding for the young research scientist, talked to someone in the public relations department of the university. And they came up with this, and they said, oh, yeah, I've heard young Bill say, that it would do this and that. Yeah, we'll put that in, make that the... So, you get, you actually get... Now, journalists, you know... I used to be a journalist many, many years ago. And I'll tell you this, and you know, you can observe this for yourself. Who is the last person in the world to hear about something? It's the journalist. Right? The, the media person is the last person in the world to hear what's going on. And they, they just have no idea. So, and they haven't got the time to pay attention. Um, the way their jobs are structured, it's too, too busy, Whoa, do this, do this. Uh, they're not going to read a research paper, they're not going to read an abstract. <laughs> Time's too precious. They're, just gonna they're not going to read the press release, for God's sake. They're just going to read the headline of the press release. And then they'll go away and write their story. 
So this is, <clears throat> this is what's happening with science, and it's to do with the huge increase in science and the government funding of science. Uh, and the, you might think, if you look back at the Lysenko affair in the 30s and 40s, that could never happen in a democratic society. Well, it can happen in a democratic society if 90% of science is funded by the government and funding is siphoned out to the, this and that person according to whether it's a, an emotional hot button issue. So this is part of what's been happening with this global warming delusion. So, <clears throat> I'm moving into the closing stretch here. Uh, I think I'll refresh, I'll refresh my throat with a bit of this soda. By the way, why is soda so attractive to drink? It's because of the bubbles. And so, what are these bubbles made of? Carbon dioxide. Yeah, I can't taste them, but they, they do add something. Um, you know, carbon dioxide, um, I say it's uh, it's 400 parts per million by volume, and in this room it's probably 500 parts per million by volume. Um, They've done a lot of research on the effects of carbon dioxide in the history of submarines, because if people go down in a submarine, the oxygen, they, every time you breathe in and breathe out, you're breathing out more carbon dioxide than you breathe in. Right? So, they wondered whether they could allow the carbon dioxide level to rise, because it'd be a lot cheaper to run the submarine. It's expensive to keep producing oxygen and replacing the oxygen in the submarine. So they've been studying this, the US Navy and lots of other navies around the world have been studying this for a long time. And um, there's also been investigative studies just looking at what the actuality is, how much carbon dioxide is actually getting into the uh, atmosphere inside submarines and can the sailors stand it. And I remember there was a research study done on US Navy submarines and it showed that um, the actual average, well the actual range was between 3,000 and 10,000 parts per million by volume. Um, and uh, it was concluded this, that it was undesirable to get up to 10,000. They try and keep it down to around 2,000, but they usually fail. Uh, it's usually between three and 5,000. Um, <clears throat> so um, carbon dioxide is a very uh, innocuous substance, and uh, it, of course, it, as well as getting into soda, um, it's also used in greenhouses to stimulate plant growth. So the fact that the, uh, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has increased uh, in recent decades significantly, one of the things that this has done is to help cure world hunger, uh, because carbon dioxide is plant food. Uh, plants thrive. Not only do, it's interesting, not only do they thrive because they get their food, carbon dioxide, they also thrive because they could become more drought resistant. They're more resistant to drought. Um, you know, plants breathe, so to speak, through little pores called stomata. And it's the same for the carbon dioxide as for the water getting out. So they cannot get more carbon dioxide in without letting more water vapor out. So therefore, if you increase the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, back to what it was a few million years ago, uh, you help the plants because they not only grow better, uh, and in places where they wouldn't grow so readily before, poorer soil and all that sort of thing. They also become more drought resistant. Uh, so anyway, just a few observations on my favorite gas. Um, <clears throat> how is the catastrophist belief system going to respond to its collapse? How are we going to witness this? Now you might say, well, you're predicting it will be gone in 10 years. That's a long time. And you may not be around in 10 years. Um, uh, well, of course, if it's going to be gone in 10 years, you're going to see signs of this a lot sooner. Uh, it's going to be very clear in five years that it's hastening to its demise. And I think it's clear now, if you look closely uh, to those in the know, um, you can see it's cracking up. Um, well, well, how is this going to happen? Well, one way it's going to happen is by individual people converting, switching their allegiance from catastrophist to skeptic. And there's already 
several good examples of this. Judith Curry was a catastrophist. She became a skeptic. Fritz Warenholt, uh, his, uh, one of his short pieces is one of the handouts. You can read it. How he moved from being a catastrophist, a believer in the hockey stick, I mean, talking about credulity, uh, and um, a green to, what, to now being, like me, a denier. Um, <clears throat> so that's going to happen. And there's also an interesting article that's there uh, by Steve Koenig. Steve Koenig was a science advisor in the first Obama administration. He came out with a piece in the Wall Street Journal a few days ago. Uh, and that piece, by the way, um, it's called um, Climate Science is Not Settled. Um, that piece is, he pulls his punches in a few respects. He fails to state things he could say. Uh, but, he, but generally speaking, that piece is absolutely accurate. Everything he says in there is true. Uh, and it's exactly what skeptics say. It's not a moderate position. Uh, this is disguised a bit. Um, here and there by some remarks he puts in. But that piece is the skeptic position. That is my position. It's the position of Richard Lindzen. It's the position of Judith Curry. It's the position of Fritz von Arnholt. It's the posi position of, of Roy Spencer. It's the position of jo John Christie. It's, it's the position of all these eminent climate scientists who are on the skeptical side. Um, and you're going to see this. You're going to see individuals coming out for climate skepticism. Uh, you know, Mackay, who wrote the book about the madness of crowds in the 19th century, he said that humans go crazy in groups, but they become sane one by one. Um, and this is, what's, this is one of the things you're going to see. You're going to see conversions. You're going to see absolutely no conversions in the other direction. You will not see a single climate scientist who's a skeptic becoming a catastrophist. What you will see is every six months, and then every three months, and then every month, you will see a catastrophist become a skeptic. Now, some people say that Richard Mueller is an exception to that. He went the other way. It's not true. He was always a catastrophist. I can talk about Richard Mueller if anybody wants to go into that. Anyway, so that's one thing that's going to happen. Um, <clears throat> the other things that are going to happen are going to be more subtle. Uh, People are going to concede individual points but continue to support generalities. So they're going to agree that hurricanes are at their lowest ever recorded. Uh, they're going to agree that polar bears have a bigger population now than they did 50 years ago. They're going to agree with all these things, but they're going to say still uh, we're facing a terrible crisis due to global warming. Another thing that's going to happen is just abandoning positions without admitting it. And this will be covered by formulas like, well, we should still be concerned. We should leave nothing to chance. Best to be on the safe side. Another thing that will happen will be the, what I've just led into, appeals to the precautionary principle. Well, just suppose there's something in it. Why, isn't it terrible to do nothing? No, it's not terrible to do nothing if what you're proposing to do is worse, if the cure is worse than the disease. Right now, I suppose I said to you, uh, <clears throat> I and a few of my friends have cooked up this theory that there's a, a very virulent uh, <clears throat> strain of influenza is about to sweep, sweep the world. Uh, and it's going to kill half the world's population. But there is something we can do about this, and that is simply amputate everybody's hands. Right? Well, shouldn't we do it? Who knows? I might be right in my speculative theory. So shouldn't we do it? Well, of course not. The cost is far too high, and the cost is certain. If you amputate everybody's hands, you've got a lot of handless people. If you shut down energy production, you have millions of additional third world babies dead. You halt industrialization of China and India. In other words, the half of the world's population that's in poverty has no hope of escaping from poverty by industrialization, something that is now actually going on. So the terrible consequences of restricting emissions of carbon dioxide are certain. They are absolutely disastrous. 
Uh, but the theory that's calling for this is highly dubious. Now, this is what I think will be the main thing you will see, however. It's the face-saving formula that at one time we were justified in thinking there was catastrophic global warming. But amazing new discoveries that have just been made have shown that we were wrong. Now, oh yeah, it's just a pesky, annoying fact that those horrible deniers were right all along, but we won't talk about that. We'll just talk about these amazing new discoveries. And I can see signs of that already happening. This is, so this is what, going to be the, one of the main ways in which it enters the media. You're going to see an increasing number of amazing new discoveries that, oh, well, we were wrong about that, we were wrong about that, we were wrong about that. And so, uh, we, don't, uh, we don't face a holocaust of warming, and, oh my God, we're slipping into an ice age. Um, so this is uh, another way in which it will happen. Um, now, as this occurs, one of the things you're going to see in the next few years, you're, you, you're already beginning to see this, but you'll see it in a very, very conspicuous way, is that... As people start retreating, compromising, abandoning, throwing overboard the catastrophist belief system, the catastrophists will start turning on themselves the way they now turn on the deniers. You see, they will start attacking each other for betraying the cause. So, and I think you can already see there is a fundamentalist catastrophist church and a liberal mainline catastrophist church. And there's two ways you can tell who belongs to the fundamentalist side. One is, they don't accept the reality of the pause. In other words, they're actually saying, I went to a Chicago public school and I don't know how to read a graph. Right? Uh, that's one way. The other way is they still defend the hockey stick. Right? Those are the two marks of the fundamentalist catastrophists. But the great mass of, of catastrophists, including the IPCC, have moved beyond that, they're in a more liberal, um, it's not, we, we don't take that literally anymore. Um, <clears throat> so, this is what I'm predicting, and you'll see this, pick up a newspaper, you'll see this, you'll see how over the next ten years the whole thing will be over. Actually, I've been saying this for more than six months, so I should say nine and a half years, four and a half years to when it's absolutely noticeable. Nine and a half years until it's all over. Uh, <clears throat> otherwise, I'll be like the IPCC. I'll keep adjusting my predictions, saying the same thing, even though it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> I, I wouldn't want to do that. I believe in what Karl Popper said. So nothing is scientific unless it can be refuted. You have to state how it can be refuted, which is what the catastrophists won't do. Um, so, that's my picture of the next uh, nine and a half years. Um, you will see this whole thing crash and burn. Uh, and then it will be forgotten about, and we'll never think about it again. We'll just look back on it, on this crazy period where a whole branch of science uh, was partly taken over by uh, people who were subject to this delusion. And that will be it. People will write books about it, and the history, histories of it, just like they now write books about the Senkoism. How could people believe this? Well, this is the explanation. Well, I'm telling you now. You don't have to wait ten years to get those books. I'm telling you now what's going to happen. Um, so, <clears throat> I think maybe it's time for me to take questions. Do you think? Yes, I think so. Thank our speaker. If I, may, if I may ask the first question for you. If I may ask the first question. Um, uh -huh. where, 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 where do you think, okay, given your views on nuclear power and the science of everything and industrialization, give us a little bit of a brief prognostication on how society may evolve in the next five or ten years, or maybe even the next fifty. Do you think that we'll be off fossil fuels? Do you see a rise in nuclear power? Just basically uh, speculate for a couple minutes. Well, you have to understand what's going on now, of course. Right. Um, I mean, well, the main thing that's going on now is a big defeat for the environmentalists, and that's fracking. And a big gain.
for the population of the world, especially the poorer half of the world. Because have you ever wondered who the good guys are and the bad guys? I can tell you, there's a very simple litmus test. There's a very simple litmus test to distinguish the good guys from the bad guys. And of course I'm including female guys in this. Um, not that much of a sexist. I was going to say I'm not a sexist, but then I can't say that. I'm not that much of a sexist. No. Good guys believe in cheap energy. Bad guys are opposed to, to cheap energy. Anybody who says, let's adopt these measures and they're just going to put up the price of energy, they're an enemy of humankind. They're an enemy of especially of the half of the world's population that's poor that haven't yet entered into modern industrial civilization. It's our great, great task to bring them into it. So that's, the, that's, the, the, that's the, the, it's that simple. If you're in favor of cheap energy, you're a good guy. If you're against cheap energy, you're a bad guy. That's that simple. Now, um, <clears throat> well, what's going on in some parts of the world, notably in places like Germany, is um, they're, install they're installing these, uh, oh, I shouldn't laugh because it's tragic, um, they're installing these uh, wind turbines. And what do they do? Well, they destroy lots of birds and bats. Um, they usually, they usually um, rope off a very large area of forest to put them in. Um, and so all these poor little birds and bats, their bodies are being exploded by these horrible things. And, uh, and of course, we know that those things are never going to generate as much electricity as it takes to run them. Right? Um, uh, not in the next 50 years, anyway. Um, and um, they don't put them in places where it's very windy, like Patagonia, just like they don't put solar power in places where it's very hot, you know. <laughs> they, put these, they put these in places where the, the ground is thickly populated with politically correct intellectuals, like Germany. <laughs> and um, that's not the best place to put these things. Uh, so um, uh, this is going to this is going to be abandoned. There's going to be a revolt of the taxpayers in Germany and the UK and places where. So these, these are some of the things you're going to see: a return of nuclear energy. I mean, there is nuclear. I mean, right now it's like uh, nearly 20% of U.S. energy still comes from nuclear power stations, but they're not being written, they're not building new ones, and they're sort of looking as though they're going to phase them out. Um, and they have phased them out in Germany. You know, I mean, ridiculous. But anyway, um, nuclear power is going to make a comeback. Um, and um, fracking is going to be a huge success. The environmentalists are not going to be able to stop, stop it. They're not going to be able to cause the deaths of millions of third world babies, as they would like. Um, and um, research into renewable energy is fine, and it will go on. And eventually, 50, 100 years from now, it may actually work in an economically viable way. Uh, it, could, it could work now in a, a small supplementary way. But there's a diff you have a different attitude to it if you realize it's a small supplementary thing and not the main thing. You've got to have the backup of the main source of power, and that's nuclear or fossil fuels. Mike, please. Okay. Burning here. You know, uh, there's 7 billion people in the world now. There's 1 billion cars now. There's 1 million jet aircraft in constant operation. Your charts here, you know, in 1940, I think there were 10 million cars and there were 1 billion people on the planet. So I think it's presumptuous of the deniers, the uh, skeptics, the catastrophists uh, to predict. And, um, you know, there's going to be 2 billion cars soon. And there's going to be 2 billion jet, air jet aircraft. The, uh, there's going to be a lot of carbon being emitted. So are you saying that burn, baby, burn as much as we can? Let's party on. Drill, baby, drill. And there, you, I think, you know, I'm a, I'm a God-fearing man. I think you sh we should be thinking about it. And you're saying it's, uh, you know, the hell with it. You know, I... What was causing CO2 back years ago? Forest fires, a volcano or two? No, yeah, what, what was, you know, what? Now all of a sudden we're going to have two billion cars because the Chinese, the Indians, all the other rest are going to want to have that. And they're going to burn a lot of oil. So, you know, what was causing CO2 50 years ago or 100 years ago? Virtually nothing. 
Okay, so, well, so I mean, uh, so let me just, okay, uh, there's, there's, two, there's two things here, really. Let me just fill you in on, some, uh, on the basic science of CO2. Um, what you have to understand is that that 400 parts per million by volume is the outcome of huge natural forces, mostly natural forces. There are huge natural forces that are adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Like millions of tons every hour. Na purely natural forces. And there, is, there are huge natural forces that are taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. But we're and these ruining two, all our forests. And, and these, right? two, these, two, <laughs> these two things, there's huge natural forces are <coughs> creating CO2, and there are huge natural forces taking CO2 away. That's, even if human beings disappeared, that would be true. Uh, <coughs> now, the... The huge natural, actually I should say one huge natural force that is taking CO2 out, photosynthesis. All green plants convert, they take carbon dioxide and sunlight and they make cellulose, which is what keeps us regular. They make sugar and starch, which is what makes us overweight. And they make a little bit each one makes a little bit of O2, oxygen gas, which enables us to breathe. That's what plants do. Every plant all over the world is working hard all the time to do that. Right? So photosynthesis is taking carbon dioxide out in huge quantities, billions of gigatons per year, taking carbon dioxide out. Uh, natural processes that are a bit more obscure and much less is known about, but they're mainly the activities of animals, insects, uh, microbes, um, are adding CO2. In fact, and if you look at annual emissions of CO2 right now, 4% are human. The other 96% are natural. Right? So, <clears throat> so that's what you have to understand, that the 400 ppmv of CO2 is an outcome. I was going to say equilibrium, but that's not quite right. It's an outcome of these two huge, colossal natural forces with a little bit of human added on the one side. Uh, but of course, the, the, the human addition doesn't automatically translate into more CO2 in the atmosphere because what it does is it stimulates plant growth. As more plants, they take CO2 out and add O2, right? So, so that's something you have to understand. Now, uh, I, I see nothing wrong with 10 million people all driving two, two SUVs. Nothing at all. Uh, carbon dioxide enriches the atmosphere. It's great. Uh, now, I would say this, however. If you do have this general outlook, which I can understand um, that many people have, um, according to demographers, mm -hmm. and like all other branches of science, they're fallible, uh, the world population is going to stop growing in 2070. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, and uh, they've always been, so far, their predictions have always been overtaken. In other words, it's, it's, they keep bringing it closer because the birth rate is collapsing everywhere in the world, mm -hmm. almost everywhere. Um, <clears throat> So, one of the, one of the benefits, if you think that way, one of the benefits of economic growth is that it causes the birth rate to collapse more rapidly, right? So, the world's population will stop growing and start declining sooner if we have rapid economic growth. Yep. So, in the long term, over a couple of centuries, the, one, the biggest predictor of human contribution to carbon dioxide is just population, just simply population. Um, so, um, if that's the way you're thinking, then w what science tells us is rapid economic growth will cause uh, the, the, Earth, the world's human population to begin to decline sooner. Um, and so, therefore, by the end of this century, the world's human population will be declining slowly, uh, and therefore, the uh, emissions of carbon dioxide ahead, other things being equal, will be declining as well. But we'll have twice as many planes and cars.
Matt Butler he, and then Karina. Yeah, uh, I am uh, one of the journalists that you uh, <laughs> alluded to earlier who likes a uh, quick headline and a good lead paragraph. But seriously, are you saying that uh, because of the fact we are seeing an increase in respiratory diseases in highly industrialized places, such as China, uh, uh, such as, uh, uh, well, it used to be true in parts of Pennsylvania, New York. Uh, are you saying that uh, this is a, pollution is a very good way of population control and that if we have enough pollution, it'll no longer be necessary to use the little pink pill? No, I'm not saying that at all. I'm, I just, I, what I'm saying is that, first of all, the respiratory d diseases are not being caused by carbon dioxide. They're being caused by sulfur dioxide, carbon monoxide, and other things, and dust, and all kinds of things like that. Uh, and, and despite that, I mean, uh, uh, two of my kids recently went to um, China with the youth orchestra. And uh, they said, certain places, you can't, you can't go out without a mask, basically. It's, it, it's that bad. But, you know, despite that, the Chinese population is gaining in health and vigor and longevity all the time, right now. I mean, this is a huge improvement in living standards overall. No, uh, I did, I, I, all emissions of different substances are not the same. Right? Carbon dioxide is not a pollutant. It enriches the atmosphere. It makes plants grow. It's great. Uh, but I agree that something should be done, we could have a separate discussion about exactly what, something should be done to curb all kinds of pollutants, including those that are making it hard to breathe in China. Uh, so, I, so that's the thing. All substances emitted by human history are not the same. Yeah, but mostly it's coal and oil. All right. Yes, Karina, and then... Uh, Dennis yeah. Nelson. What else? Uh, are we at peak oil? <coughs> Is, is the supply of uh, oil finite? Are we at peak oil? When will oil run out? Um, actually, this is something I haven't looked at for quite some time. But my understanding is from people who've been looking at it recently is that it's going to last for centuries. And of course, fracking is the big breakthrough here. I mean, you know, <coughs> there's enormous, enormous quantities of the stuff. It, it just, and the, we've known about this for a long time. I, when I was a kid, I remember reading about uh, oil shale and uh, that it was too expensive to get out and um, it's just that technological advance has changed things. Um, so um, no I don't think you know um, industry changes and um, you know in, I, I always think of them in the 19th century where people projected that if cities went on growing the way they were then all cities would be 10 feet deep in horse shit. Right? Because that was an extrapolation. They, uh, in, in, uh, in, I don't know about in, yeah, I think it's true in the United States, but in Britain, people refer to it as mud. When people talk about mud in the streets, what they meant is it was several inches of horse shit. Um, and, um, uh, you know, um, horse-drawn horse conveyances didn't go out of fashion because the horseshit got too deep. We, we just moved, we moved beyond that and invented this wonderful thing it's called the car, the automobile. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, so I think that um, nuclear and other sources uh, will, and also some of these renewable sources that I was belittling, but they will come into their own eventually with a lot of research. Um, <clears throat> uh, they will... Uh, you see, what, what, would, what would happen if we actually started to run out of oil is the price of oil would go up. I, and I don't mean just the way it goes up now. I mean inflation adjusted. The price of oil now adjusting for inflation is much, much lower than it was 60, 70 years ago. Much lower. That's, that means it's less scarce now than it was then. Um, and <clears throat> so if, what would actually happen is uh, if there was any chance whatsoever that we might start to run out of oil, is the price of oil would start to rise slowly and remorselessly, and it would make these alternatives much more attractive, and people would put more funds into research spontaneously to develop some of these alternatives. So I don't, I don't see peak oil. I just think that's sort of confused, bemuddled thinking. Uh, Dennis Nelson. 
Uh, thanks for coming this evening. Um, my question pertains to this article by Stephen Coonan that you, mm -hmm. from the uh, Wall Street Journal that you handed out that I was familiar with before I came here this, uh, this evening. Uh, isn't uncertainty a major reason why climate action is so urgent? You have to explain that. That's what he says in the article. We are very far from the knowledge needed to make good climate policy. There's so many uncertainties that we really can't do anything. And uh, I looked stuff up on uh, Joseph Rom's climate blog, the climate progress, where I always go to. And he and, he and other climate uh, scientists and experts seem to say that the opposite is true. That because the remaining uncertainties in climate science do not undermine the case for strong action. In fact, we, we need, you know, because we have these uncertainties, like, uh, for example, like weather and that sort of thing on a local and regional level, that this is even more of a call of action instead of sticking uh, your, your heads in the sand, and that's what you and Kunin seem to be saying right now. Well, um, one point that's sometimes overlooked here is that when a climate scientist starts talking about public policy, he's leaving climate science behind, and he's moving into an area where he's no better qualified to talk than you or I. Right? Public, policy doesn't auto public policy doesn't flow from climate science, right? Uh, when somebody says, oh, uh, the risks are so great we'd better do something, that's not climate science, that's politics, that's economics. Um, and um, there have been econometric studies done of the, uh, you know, we're talking here about something really quite simple, the a general warming. What would what will ha what would happen if if the world's uh, temperature got a bit warmer? Um, and there have been econometric studies done of this. Um, one of them by a guy named Toll, T O L, uh, and uh, you know he came out with, he's done a lot of work on this, and he's, he buys completely, because he's not a climate scientist, he's an economist who's studying the effects of, of um, these impacts, um, he, buy, he he's a, buys completely the majority IPCC view, right? Um, but he says that, based on, on his calculations, uh, that are very thorough, uh, that warming will be a benefit for, the, for two, two degrees, up to two degrees warming, will be a benefit, right? That's what Toll, it's not in that article, Toll says that. You can, I can give, send you uh, citations to his work and so on. Um, so, uh, and then after, after two degrees, it will, he, according to Toll, it will start to get worse. Um, <clears throat> so, um, the idea that because something's uncertain, it calls for immediate drastic action is a strange thing to me. Um, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think that there's a lot of, un in my mind, there's not a lot of uncertainty about whether it's better to be warmer or colder. I'm in favor of it being warmer. Right? Um, human beings are tropical animals. Uh, you know, they flourish when it gets warmer. Uh, when, the, when the last glaciation ended, like 15,000, 12,000 years ago, that was when human beings separated themselves from the beasts. That's when they started to do all these wonderful things, making pottery, making to, uh, elaborate tools and so on. That's when they started expanding everywhere. Um, we are tropical animals. We can't live outside the tropics without artificial aids. Clothing to keep heat close to our surface, buildings to keep heat uh, more broadly, and fire to, keep, to warm things up. Without those three things, we're dead outside the tropics. We have to take the tropics with us wherever we go. We're tropical animals. Um, and to me, the pa you know, this is something everybody really acknowledges. If people go to the Caribbean or something like that where it's very warm, um, <clears throat> what do they say spontaneously? They say, this is paradise. That's what everybody says. You know? uh, and uh, it's true. That, those are the conditions best for human beings. So I'm... I'm in favor of more warming than two degrees, actually. That's my dirty little secret. But, um, uh, I don't, you know, now, the rapidity with which any change occurs poses problems of adjustment. Um, so, one of the consequences of warming is rising sea level. Uh, the sea level has been hundreds of meters high, or over 100 meters higher than it is today. It's also been a lot lower, so that you can walk from Alaska to... Uh, to Siberia and not just see it as 
Um, she, uh, what's it? Sarah Palin played. She could, um, you know. So um, you, you, you know. Uh, so that's that. If you have a seafront property, you might be worried by rising sea level. On the other hand, warmer warming and rising sea level means that vast acres, millions of billions of acres of land in Russia, Canada, Alaska, northern China, uh, which are now pretty useless, become useful. Uh, so actual land area grows with rising sea level, a youth strength, paradoxical though it may seem. So um, in broad terms, I'd li I like the idea of warming. I think it's great. Uh, if, we, if, if carbon dioxide really was a control knob, I would say turn up that control knob, let's get it warmer. Okay. Um, but sudden change can be uh, inconvenient for a lot of people. So what, we, what would be best would be gradual change and permanent change. Real quick. Right. The real you over here. Okay, real quick. Uh, we It's getting to be about 8.15. I'd like to try to close out the question session in about 10 minutes. So, you know, if we got all like right, four or five you. people. Yes. I, first of all, thank you so much for finally nailing the Nazi environmentalist for their secret plan to want to kill children and keep the poor in, in total destitution. I've suspected this for years, and thank you for putting words to that effect. Um, and I, I was thinking as you were talking about the contributions to greenhouse gases. I think methane is one of the big ones. I was thinking about that because animals produce it, and I was wondering what your view of animal production of methane was. Well, um, I didn't bring the numbers with me, but methane is even smaller than carbon dioxide. Uh, the biggest greenhouse gas is water vapor. The biggest greenhouse gas is water vapor. Let's be clear about that. And you remember when I say that, I mean water vapor. Um, uh, that's, that is the, the, the greenhouse gas par excellence. And the, in fact, the theory of the catastrophes, the theory they have as to why there would be this great amplification, is what they say is this. If you, increase, if you add carbon dioxide, you cause warming, the warming will cause more water vapor, which will then cause more warming, and you'll get runaway warming, right? That's their, their argument. Um, and of course, the, one of the rebuttals of this is that throughout history, or throughout prehistory actually mainly, or a little bit throughout history, it's been warmer, and that hasn't happened. Um, uh, and, and when you add carbon dioxide, you not only add water vapor, it's true that if you add carbon, if it gets warmer, if it gets warmer, it will be the, the air will get more moist. Um, All right. So, um, okay. Okay. David Tucker. Yes, you say global rise. You say the rising of of the sea levels is good for some countries. What about places like the Maldives? Yeah. No. I. I, I mean. I, I agree. There's great problems of adjustment. And and. Uh, but I mean. Look. I don't th unfortunately, I don't think we're going to see two degrees warming. I think we're going to see, uh, we, I don't think we'll see another degree of warming. Uh, and remember that, remember that so far, the catastrophists have always been wrong in their predictions. Always, every time. You know, when James Hansen went before Congress in 1988 and made these predictions, they've all, they've all you know, he gave several predictions. He, he said, if we have business as usual, continued growth of emissions. Uh, then we'll have this amount of warming. And it, it, he was delivering this during a heat wave in Washington. <laughs> so it carried a lot of conviction because people are influenced by uh, accidental circumstances. And then if we mitigate it somewhat by cutting down on emissions, then it's going to be this. And if we make a, a huge cut in emissions, then it's going to be this. Right? Well, actually, the emissions were way above the business as usual projection. The actual temperature is way below his bottom projection. And that's the beginning of the whole succession. They've always been wrong. They've always predicted greater warming than has occurred. Um, and they, they, didn't, they didn't say, you know, now that you, the way you read some people, it's, it's, they, you know, they thought that they allowed for the possibility that there would be things like the floor. No, they didn't. They wrote their predictions ruled that out. Uh, now, where, where the predictions are not absolutely wrong, they gave a range of probabilities. And in those cases, you find that 
if they're not absolutely outside the range, the actual outcome is at the bottom end. It's never near the center of their projections. So, uh, so basically, they've always been wrong. And, um, uh, you know, so uh, I don't expect these catastrophic uh, effects to occur. Now, if with warming, there, will be, there has been, you know, for the past 200 years, there has been a, a rise of sea level. You know, it's been rising by a, a very small amount, a few millimeters a year, right? Um, and um, uh, I, I expect that if warming continues, that will go on. If warming is reversed, as might happen soon, um, that will be put into reverse. Uh, and, but it is true that um, <clears throat> any kind of climate change, colder or warmer, uh, will greatly inconvenience some people. Um, or even staying the same will, will inconvenience some people. Uh, so, yes, uh, but it will benefit other people. I mean, there are, there are losers yeah. and gainers. All right. Yeah, like massive yeah. droughts. Yeah, massive droughts. Yeah. Uh, Iliana, can you say it uh, quickly? Yeah, very quick. So, so my, my question is, uh, you mentioned that there are some uh, people who are wearing masks. And what government do about it? Or they don't do nothing? Oh, well, because, it's not every city. Because I saw in the Google, all in China's uh, major city, they were in masks. Then why? And what go government not helping to, with this dilemma? No. Um, it's not every city. Um, and you must remember that certain parts, China is a big place, and some parts of China. Um, have not seen much urbanization and much, much uh, industrialization. Uh, on the other hand, the parts that have have seen this absolutely spectacular um, uh, growth. Um, what's the government doing about it? I don't know what the government's doing about it, if anything. I mean, the government seems to be composed, as far as I can tell, I haven't studied this in depth, but it seems to be composed of, of um, people who have absorbed Western education either immediately by going abroad or by people who have gone abroad teaching them. Um, and they have decided that the best way to develop the country is laissez-faire. So they're not interfering uh, uh, in, um, in industry. Um, and of course, the fact that there is no democracy uh, means that there are no pressure groups able to lobby successfully to bring in these measures. So right for the... Which, and now the fact that they can't bring in these measures, you can have one or two views about, but it is certainly conducive to industrialization. But it's not every city in China. It's, a, it's certainly not every city. All right. Rios? Yeah. I remember yeah, I not too long ago, but I reports about large sections of the south, of the po south, south polar ice sheet breaking off and floating away. I remember um, video movies of Greenland's ice cap melting and running into the sea. And I remember going up to Glacier National Park in Montana and having people who saw the glacier just within their lifetime tell me how it's shrunking back. And I remember people who went up to Alaska in cruise boats who see the glaciers there and are told that only 20 years ago, it was several miles, you know, it has shrunk several miles since then. How do you calm my fear that this is not melting ice everywhere? Well, there's different ways to answer that, but I mean, let, let's get a few things straight. Antarctic ice has been growing continuously and is now at the highest level ever recorded. Um, there is a little bit of Antarctica called the Antarctic Peninsula that comes way out, where there has been a loss of ice. But the, uh, Antarctica, the huge continent, it's thicker, it's stronger, it's greater than it's ever been. I mean, in recorded. I mean, not, it's not greater than it's been in, human, in looking at the proxy record. But in terms of observation by humans who've been studying it, it's, it's been growing. So, um, in the last couple of years, Arctic ice has started to reconstitute. You see, these are cyclical processes. Um, and so, even when Arctic ice was shrinking, 
world ice was constant because Antarctic ice was growing. Um, so that's that's part of it. But but you know these things are um, these things are the, the cyclical trends, and there have been there have been periods even in human history where you know there was a northwest passage where you could sail through, which is blocked now by ice. Uh, there was the, the there was the Norse colonization of Greenland where they could sail right round Greenland because the northern part was not frozen. Um, that was in the medieval warm period. Um, <clears throat> And um, the, 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 then there's the long-term view, I'm afraid, of the thousands of years, where glaciers grow and eventually... When, when I say that in the glaciation, Ch uh, Chicago will be under several miles of ice, you have to understand that begins with glaciers. Glaciers grow and spread, and then eventually they join up, and then eventually they take over the land, and there's nothing but a huge ice thing there. And most of the glaciers that we're talking about shrinking in the last few hundred years uh, they're relatively new glaciers. They were only formed in the last couple of thousand years. There were, there were no, you know, there was, and one of the things that occasionally, if you look at these newspaper reports about glaciers melting, one of the things that occasionally, they, they, because it makes a, a nice story for the reporter, it's mentioned, uh, but it's more or less uniform, is that as these glaciers melt, what do they find? They uncover human habitations. They uncover houses as well as forests uh, that, are, that, that have been covered up by, the, by, by these glaciers in the last couple of thousand years. So um, <clears throat> there, will, there will be ups and downs. You know, when, when we went into the last glaciation, like over 100,000 years ago, uh, there was a long period where global temperatures were falling. But there were often periods of a couple of hundred years where they were, where, where they were rising. So people around at that time, they're always getting warmer. Well, they didn't, because these things are never noticeable anyway, uh, except with special instruments. But if they'd been that acutely observant, they might have said that. Um, but, um, you know, so you are going to get, over the next few thousand years, you're going to get occasional episodes of two or three hundred years where it gets warmer, ice melts, glaciers shrink, uh, and that's going to be reversed, because we're going into the new glaciation. It's inevitable, nothing can stop it. Um, and the, the glaciers will grow again. Uh, so, uh, I hope, I, I wish I could make the glaciers go away completely. I wish I could melt all the ice. And the earth used to be like that for millions of years before 65 million years ago, uh, where there was no ice anywhere. Um, but uh, we're now in an ice age, and uh, we have glaciers with us all the time. Um, it's very unfortunate, but there they are. They're not going to go away. All right. Uh, L. T. Anderson, uh, then uh, Jim Fiduzzi. Then that will be the last <coughs> question, Brom. I have uh, just two two quick things to ask. Uh, are you uh, currently working or are you retired? That's one question. Uh, if you're working for somebody, uh, I'd like. Can you tell me what you do for a living? And the other thing is, what country or countries have you lived in during the last 20 years? Well. Um, I work as an editor for a book publishing company. That's my job. Uh, I haven't retired, and I don't think I'll ever be able to afford to retire. Um, which is a shame, because I like to write, and uh, I would spend my time writing if I could retire. But, um, so that's what I do for a living. I edit books. Um, and um, uh, the only countries I've lived in for any length of time are uh, the UK and the USA. How much time in the USA anything? the last few years? Sir? Last 30 years. Last 30 years here in the yes. USA? Mm -hmm. Thank okay. you. Um, yeah, I think you discount the uh, various um, feedback loops involving methane, such as flat rate release and sun rate release. Yeah, this is part of climate sensitivity, right? I mean, we're talking about the, the, all the possible feedbacks. That's one. I mean, that's not the one the catastrophes usually place the most emphasis on, but it has been, um, it has been discussed. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, basically, it seems to me, um, from what I've read and from the t skeptical climate scientists I've talked to and read about, um, this, what, and what we call skeptical here means skeptical about catastrophism, right? It doesn't mean skeptical in the ancient Greek sense. Um, uh, are not, they're not actually skeptics. They have a definite point of view, and the point of, and their point of view is 
that climate sensitivity is low. Um, and that um, uh, raising CO2 levels is not going to cause uh, a runaway process by any of these different methods that have been suggested. And the arguments for that are partly historical. Uh, now they're being, su they're being supplemented by detailed studies. Right. And that, that's one thing, by the way, uh, I ought to mention there. Um, if you're interested in any area of science, you can get hold of the papers in that area that are coming out all the time, every week, thousands of them. Um, in climate science, so climate science, remember, is a newly cobbled together discipline didn't exist 50 years ago. There were, meteor there were chairs of meteorology, there were atmospheric physicists, and there were geologists and different people. But climate science has been, is an immature science that's been put together recently. Um, and in that area of climate science, um, it's not that there's a constant pitched argument between catastrophes and skeptics. Most of the evidence for the skeptical position comes from people who pay lip service to catastrophism. This is, this is what's actu what actually happens. Uh, that somebody will write, do a study, the results will be a bit inconvenient for, catast for the catastrophist orthodoxy. They will put a few lines in their, in their paper saying, this doesn't, of course we accept catastrophism. Um, and um, uh, we, we don't suggest that this contradicts it. However, here are our results. Uh, and the skeptics read these papers and they use these results for their arguments. Because, I mean, a, a classic example was um, the paper that came out last year from Wunsch and Heimbach. Um, Wunsch, uh, these are the two, are uh, probably the two most eminent ocean scientists in the world. Uh, Wunsch is at MIT, Heimbach is at Harvard. Uh, that paper that came out last year, uh, basically what it said was, I'm greatly simplifying it, I urge you to get hold of it and read the paper yourself, but what it actually said was, you see, when the pores started, the pores of, uh, of uh, the temp surface temperature had not risen, the, there, all kinds of arguments came back from the catastrophes to explain this, and, but the most popular is, the heat is hiding in the oceans. Right? This is, that's the most popular one. Um, actually, 20 years ago, skeptical climate scientists were saying we shouldn't pay so much attention to these surface temperatures because the oceans are so important. And that was just scoffed at and dismissed by the, by the catastrophists because they had a rising trend of surface temperatures. Uh, now they've got the pause. They're casting around in, in a panic for something that will rescue their theory. And, one of the, and the most popular one, the one they've settled on, most of them, is that it's, the heat is hiding in the oceans. Well, this paper that came out last year from um, Wunsch and Heimbach, um, both Americans, despite their very German name, uh, um, uh, it basically says the oceans are getting colder. Uh, I mean, there's tremendous oversimplification. Just read the paper. But that's what it says. The oceans are getting colder. Um, and... Um, uh, there's a, a couple of lines in their paper where they say, where they pay lip service to the um, to the catastrophist position. You see, now, one should Heimbach study the oceans, but they're not going to make any waves. Okay. All right, Brom. At this point, it's about eight thirty something. Yes. We need to get into the rebuttal period fairly quickly. Uh, yes. Uh, that's, well, let's right, let's. Uh, you'll have to start. Uh, Bill went in the rebuttal period. Okay. How many? Uh, you can have the first rebuttal. How many? Uh, how many rebuttors do we have tonight? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All right, nine. We can probably go about four minutes each. Uh, some probably won't use the full amount of time. David, you'll get the final word as no. usual. We'll probably go a little past nine, but let's try to respect the restaurant. Um, let's get to it. I've got timer in hand. Let's thank our speaker, David Ramsey, one more time. All right. Bill, if you want to rebut, get up there and uh, 
You got four minutes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's kind of a middle ground on uh, this question. People that don't who think there's something to the argument, I think it's uh, greatly exaggerated. Uh, I think there are ways of dealing with global warming. Now, for some years I've advocated a return of steam locomotives for fast, heavy freight trains. And, uh, uh, you know, I might uh, seem like an environmental disaster, but I think the fuels could be Industrial hemp, a form of tobacco, or a thorium size, a truck size thorium reactor. Uh, now, the uh, acid rain was not a problem until about 10 years after steam locomotives disappeared. So it, uh, it wouldn't be that problem. Uh, Yeah, and the Rockefellers just announced recently yeah. that they're not going to invest any more in fossil fuels. Boy, they are oil. <laughs> that's the other one. Well, I think that's... Well, you, you and you heads, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, you've kind of got a drill baby drill attitude, too. Uh, Yeah, you kind of think the uh, economy is a bottle when it's actually a cow. Uh, no, I don't know. Thanks, Bill. point by Bill. Yeah, the Rockefellers divested themselves of any relationship with oil. And the Rockefellers are oil. <laughs> I mean, it's, that's who Exxon is now in Standard Oil. You know, I almost wish this stuff wasn't called climate change or global warming because this is a bigger issue. I wish it was called carbon costs or something like that. I think what it comes down to is is it better that we burn more oil or burn less or coal? I think we're getting a handle on coal, but I think most people would think logically and rationally that it's probably better off if we burn less oil going forward because there's going to be all these cars and planes and stuff. So, um, so I think when I to to, to when I chime to this carbon cost things, like, I don't, I think this ISIS is another oil war. I just don't see a couple Americans getting killed that we're going to spend hundreds of billions of dollars in the next few years again in Iraq. I know Halliburton and oil companies put a lot of money in Iraq building up the infrastructure for oil. But I see this as a third oil war after Kuwait and uh, after the WMDs in Iraq or whatever Bush and Cheney thought up. So, like I say, I think this is a more an issue of carbon costs and climate change. I don't, I don't really, I'm not crazy about, I mean, I haven't even made up my mind on climate stuff. It's too hard for me to think about. Um, okay, so, oh, and by the way, top 10 companies in the world are either, five of them are either making cars or making oil. So who do you think runs the world? Oil companies. So that's why we'll probably always have military in the Middle East for oil.
as, ma as much as everybody thinks we're job. getting a lot of tar sands and oil shale out there, we still are hugely dependent on Mideast oil, and the world is. Um, so, yeah, you know, we, we talked a little bit. Oh, oh, I wanted to make a point. I think one of the worst things from what I've heard and understood about climate change is that massive droughts could be in the future. And that's a lot more serious than people think. If we can't grow corn or soybeans or other agriculture crops in the world, that could be a real huge, huge issue. <laughs> I mean, we still uh, need to eat. Okay, time. That's it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Next. Go ahead, Dennis. Okay. Okay, David, thanks for your presentation, but quite frankly, we really should hear about attention reality check needed and the delusion that human-made climate disruption doesn't exist except the sound science that it, that it does. Just like a kid riding a bicycle, planet Earth needs a safety helmet. I'm a longtime free speech advocate. For example, I've submitted online comments in support of internet neutrality to the Federal Communications Commission and President Barack Obama, free and open internet. But David acts like the de facto mouthpiece for a well-orchestrated, deceptively um, deliberately deceptive disinformation, misinformation campaign funded by the large fossil fuelish, or you could also say fossil foolish polluters. They only want to deny the scientific consensus and reality behind human-caused climate disruption and delay any immediate and meaningful national, international actions to deal with it. That's why I call them climate deniers, delayers. Their purpose is to deliberately create doubt, confusion, and inaction. This is a morally, ethically bankrupt, unscientific, ideologically driven campaign. It is well documented in books like Merchants of Doubt, Climate Cover-Up, Science is a Contact Sport, The Heat is On, Behind the Curve, and The Hockey Stick, and The Climate Wars. And I particularly want to discuss the last book that I have here in my hand by climate scientist Dr. Michael Mann at Penn State University. The Hockey Stick Graph that uh, David alluded to in his presentation has especially been attacked by the climate deniers delayers. It shows a dramatic upward spike in the average surface temperature of the earth that directly coincides with our modern industrialization and inefficient burning of fossil fuels. Rather than being totally discredited or broken as uh, David has maintained, the hockey stick graph has been reaffirmed by the National Academy of Sciences, the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and over 12 independent peer-reviewed scientific studies. But you'll never hear that from David. Now it takes considerable time and effort for Dr. Mann and his colleagues to respond point by point to the fabricated, bogus, flawed, and inaccurate criticisms from climate deniers to layers. You can tell how effective the climate scientists are by how their case is being attacked by the climate deniers to layers. Now, David, cherry pick a couple examples, and I don't agree with that kind of behavior where people have said, oh, well, the, you know, the climate deniers delayers should be shot, blah, blah, blah. But that's not the real important issue. The more important issue is that the much more important thing is that climate scientists are now being personally harassed and intimidated. <coughs> David didn't mention anything about that. And, and they are fighting back. Michael Mann has filed a defamation lawsuit against the right-wing National Review. I refer to this well-written viewpoint by Gene Lyons entitled Climate Change Deniers Resort to Character Attacks that appeared in the Chicago Sun-Times Saturday, August uh, 16th of this year. Climate deniers delayers such as TV commentators in the National Review, they're going to rant and rave about their right for free speech. But do they have the so-called right to poison the airwaves and print media with slanderous and libelous politically motivated <coughs> smears against the professional integrity and private character of a prominent climate scientist like Dr. Mann. This is at the same time that the big fossil fuelish polluters are poisoning our atmosphere. Now, I'm a longtime participant here at the college. I understand that the college practices free speech and respect to contrarian points of view. 
But I think in this case, I'm now re recommending that the, co the college practices responsible speech when it comes to the subject of human-caused climate disruption. I think we would be we, much better spending time discussing climate policy. I would be willing to help set that up. Okay. This is because there is no actual debate <laughs> over sorry. climate science. Okay, I'll let him go. David's junk science filled presentation merely shows that climate deniers to layers really don't have a leg to stand on. We're really behind the eight ball, the climate eight ball, and we need to move forward pronto with constructive solutions for mitigation, which is our top priority, and adaptation, which is our second priority. Otherwise, the college should schedule somebody from the International Flat Earth Society, which claims that satellite photographs taken of our planet are faked, or a representative from the tobacco industry, which claims that secondhand smoke is harmless. I'm ending my rebuttal on a positive note. We can prevent the worst effects of climate disruption. We can succeed in fully implementing technically and economically feasible non-nuclear energy and non-fossil fuel strategies around the world by 2050. Only energy efficiency and micropower, which consists of cogeneration appropriate <laughs> renewables can make the larger scale and deeper meaningful and timely cuts in our carbon pollution. This will be much more preferable in protecting our public health, maintaining our ecological health, enhancing our economic well-being, and strengthening our energy security. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you so We did allow uh, David to go an extra couple minutes. They requested a couple minutes. Dennis. Dennis, I'm sorry. Dennis. So I'm going to keep my rebuttal very short and very sweet. You know, it, it is one thing that there is a solution to Dennis's dilemma and our speaker's dilemma. And that, my friend, is the widespread adaptation of the newer Generation 4 thorium-based molten salt reactors. We're not going to do it by getting our fossil fuel economy, keeping it going in perpetuity. I've spoken on this topic in the past, and as I'm looking more and more into the future, when you consider the aspects of an equation, E equals MC squared, we're kind of crazy to be using even chemical reactions for our modern industrial society. I also agree with David that our modern, in the form of the uh, heavy water reactors that we use today are inherently dangerous, which is why we need innovation in the field. And even with David Ramsey, uh, with, with our speaker's proposals on, on population, which I agree with, all of us can agree that clean, cheap energy is what's going to be the best way to develop this planet, the best way forward to move this planet, and frankly, the only way I can see that being done is through the implementation of thorium-based molten salt reactors. I'm not the only one who agrees here. China's already got 200 people working on the problem, and if we don't, we they might be the next... You think we had trouble with Middle East oil? Wait until we start having trouble with with Chinese thorium-based reactors. What are we going to do? <laughs> thorium-based molten salt reactors. Sounds kind of appetizing to me. <laughs> Makes me think of maybe popcorn. <laughs> or what you see down at the bottom of the popcorn. Anyway, uh, uh, Mr. Bolger, Tim Bolger talks about uh, thorium-based molten salt reactors, and uh, I think that the free market will handle the whole thing perfectly because we have so many people uh, involved in so many different mediums of energy that we will let the best one prevail and that will be determined by the free market. But on the other hand, when we look at what this uh, other 
gentleman talked about just before Jim, uh, I believe his name was Dennis, and he's emphatically stating that we're going to definitely have heavy duty global warning, warming, then I think in that case, for all of you people who believe that, then I think that the best thing to do is to go to South Dakota, North Dakota, Michigan, uh, even Alaska. Uh, in most of those places, like Michigan, it goes down to 40, 45 below in the wintertime. In uh, North, South and North Dakota, it goes down to, I think, 60 below in the wintertime. Well, I suggest you go there and buy as much land as you can because with global warming, these areas are going to become more akin to Florida or Louisiana, <laughs> where there'll be prime property for vacation spots and prime property for farming. You'll get rich beyond your wildest dreams simply by investing in cheap raw land in these places that the winter time tears up. And that's about all I got to say. Next. Okay, Andy. Thank you for giving a presentation tonight. There was an excellent summary of one side of a so-called debate in America and the world. Um, there's a quote in this book, This Changes Everything. The quote is, As soon as climate deniers admit the climate change is real, then the central, they will lose the central ideological battle of our time. One, one climate de denier from one of the big corporations finally admitted, he said, climate, climate change is obviously real and it's obviously caused to a significant extent by people. I really don't think there's room for any debate on either of these points anymore. So now, to slow down the spread, the transition away from trillions of dollars worth of fossil fuels that are still in the ground and planning to be burned, consumed, whatever, we have to create doubt. That's what that book, Merchants of Doubt, talks about. People give uh, tremendous presentations saying that uh, there's doubt. And the media, the media present this like a debate. They presented the tobacco debate 20 years after the science was solid and there was no debate at all. But they allowed scientists to stand at a podium and say, oh yeah, there's still a debate. Secondhand smoke is not, uh, the evidence is not all in. We're still doing research. Well, as long as you're still doing research, uh, you know, the Flat Earth Society is still doing research, but the rest of us have gone with the Ball Earth evidence <laughs> because the database on the Ball Earth side is pretty big. Uh, three quick points. Living in America for the last 30 years and not knowing about the disaster of nuclear power or the disaster at Fukushima or the disaster at Three Mile Island or Chernobyl it shows a clear lack of grasp on the reality of that situation. <laughs> um, being, not living in a monastery somewhere with no radio, television, or anything else, and living out in the real world with the rest of us, and being able to claim that fracking is a huge success, <laughs> when the reality is that it's a disaster of biblical proportions, is again a lack of grasp on reality just living in a bubble. I've talked about this, uh, we're in our 37th year of Project Censored, putting out the book <coughs> Censored News. It shows how me the media in America and a lot of book publishers run a two-pronged process. You promote the myth on all channels 24-7 and you simultaneously run a blackout on the scientists that are publishing 
the reality, the database. Renewable, to say that renewable energy is 50 to 100 years in the future uh, toward making any meaningful contribution is exactly the opposite of the reality that Amory Lovins was quoting to people in 1988 in his world travels. They said we're trying to develop a new motor or some efficient thing. He would point out that what you're trying to develop is already being used and sold in this country. It's been mass produced for four years. We are in the middle of an economic and energy efficiency global revolution. And nobody is talking about shutting down uh, in an industry, uh, you know, shutting down capitalism or anything else. They're talking about changing the system to something other than billionaires gone wild. That's what we have today. Billionaires gone wild. We're shoveling money to the owners of these billionaire-owned companies in, in amounts that have never been seen in recorded history. 150 million Americans now are insecure, uh, semi-employed, underemployed, half the country. I mean, it, uh, and the media has just been lying to us about this. Oh, oh, Graham, he said lying. He I, said I, lying. Said, I said the media. I didn't say any particular person. I said uh, some... some Pat Butler is there. He insulted Pat Butler. Let me finish, please. Check him out. And uh, the last point, um, they're not talking about, they're not really, the climate scientists aren't worried about a, a one or two degree rise per se. What they're worried about is all the studies that show that methane is uh, 15, 20, 30 times worse going into the atmosphere than carbon dioxide. They're referring to it as a methane burp that would cause the planet to warm up 10 or 12 degrees in a decade. And that would be it for 97% of uh, species on Earth. So uh, the science is overwhelmingly accepted by 99%. They're, they're claiming, all the studies are claiming about 97% of client scientists are on the what uh, David referred to as the catastrophic side in projections. And only 3% are claiming that it's not a problem. So uh, keep reading, everybody. Thank you. Okay, he's done. Graham, how come he gets to call people liars, Graham? <laughs> Pat Butler's a media guy sitting right there. How come he gets to call people liars and I get chastised for it? Somehow I'm some bad boy because I call the yes, guy a liar you and you call people liars. Try to control yourself, right? No, you try to control yourself. Get him out of here. Get him out of here. Go ahead, Andy. He called him a liar. If I gotta okay. leave, Andy's gotta leave. Okay, better up. Go ahead, Dave. Better up. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> welcome to the College of Complexes. Um, we heard earlier from Tim about ferrium uh, <coughs> molten salt reactors. Does this come in a blue box that says if it rains, it pours on it? Um, <laughs> With regard to the comments about nuclear power, um, I would say the following. First of all, the nuclear industry in this country never came up with a solution as to what to do with radioactive waste. And that stuff just piles up and piles up and is going to be a danger for hundreds, perhaps even thousands of years. That's number one. Number two, the nuclear industry took a great many shortcuts in the construction of the nuclear plants and lied about it. And as a result, you had, as Andy pointed out, the disaster at Three Mile Island, and in Japan, <coughs> the disaster at Fukushima. Um, secondly, some 40 years, 45 years ago, when I was in high school in Evanston, Commonwealth Edison was busy building its own nuclear plant at Zion. And they promised us cheap electricity. And they even aired all these little commercials with this cute little light bulb on it. <laughs> yeah, little Bill, who was like a bird in a light bulb. Little Bill! Well, the Bill doesn't look very little to me. And, and since that time, Zion had a lot of flaws, and they finally had to shut it down, and I understand they're in the process of decommissioning it. Yes, sir. Secondly, or next of all, we were accused of being, those of us in the environmental movement were accused of being Nazis. We were accused of being bad guys who are murdering kids in the third world. <laughs> yeah. All we ever have said is that we want a world 
which has renewable energy sources that don't pollute the air, that don't pollute our drinking water, and that provide a saner way to live. And finally, all these scientists who are busy being in the climate denier business, well, they remind me of the sort of doctors and scientists who used to be quoted in the commercial some 50 years ago when I was a teenager, in which you heard something like, nine out of 10 doctors recommend anison or buffering. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, David. <laughs> <laughs> See you next week, Brown. Right. See you next week. Yeah, <laughs> I don't usually come away from the college of complexes terribly confused because I know that confusion is part of the atmosphere. <laughs> However, I don't know whether, all due respect to our speaker who gave a very good presentation. However, I don't know whether his message is relax, it'll pass, take the long view, or get your affairs in order, but don't tell anyone else you're doing it. <laughs> uh, I got a mix, very mixed message here, and I'm one of these guys, I'm very uncomfortable when I start getting mixed messages, because I am your typical reporter, I do like to see a nice press release with a headline and all of the salient stuff toward the top and then we work down in a inverse pyramid. Uh, you know the bit. And, uh, you know, it, it, it works. You know, I can't help it. The German Shepherd is the dog that it is. I am the dog that I am. And uh, I don't know what the answer is to this. Uh, I was at a party about five or six years ago, seated next to me was a retired general, and we were talking about uh, the Middle East and the, the causes for modern wars and all of that sort of thing. And he said, the next war is going to be fought over water, and it's going to be fought on all continents. And he pointed out to me that the day may come when we may be the new Middle East because we've got the largest, the largest body uh, of non-salt water, the Great Lakes, and that will become something that is much sought after, and we are going to be in a position perhaps to parcel it out uh, either very carefully and very justly or in a very, very greedy fashion. Um, we need, you know, in 1942, President Roosevelt called together a group of scientists, sent them off to a place where they were, you know, practically incommunicado for the next several years with the orders to produce a nuclear bomb. Perhaps, perhaps this president would do well to call together the experts on both sides of this question, lock them up and force them to come up with a workable policy because we do not have one right now. On one hand, we've got the people who rightly claim we're polluting each other to death, and on the other hand, we've got the people who say, take the wrong view, uh, it will shake itself out. Will it shake itself out when our entire eastern seaboard is underwater? Is that the temporary inconvenience that we have to live with? Uh, or will it shake itself out when much of our country, once rich in agricultural land, becomes a desert? Um, I'm not an expert in any of these things, but I do know enough that when you are perplexed by these kinds of things, you call together the experts, you put them in a position where they have to come up with some kind of a working policy so that we can walk away at least knowing what we have to do next. Right now, we have no guideposts. We don't know exactly where we're supposed to go. And I want to thank our speaker for coming up with one of the most provocative talks that I've heard here in a long time, and I mean that as a compliment. I also think we have to accept the fact that it may take us a couple of weeks here at the College of Complexes 
to come up with a solution that the world should follow. <laughs> <laughs> Get the last word. Final word. Okay. I don't mind having the last word. Um, well, as, uh, as always, I like to um, try and reply to um, all the significant points. A lot of it was um, was not really uh, trying to answer my arguments, but just calling me names, um, which is, uh, you know, uh, free speech and everything. Um, uh, if the climate warms, there will be fewer droughts. If the climate cools, there will be more droughts. Um, if we look at um, if we look at the way the world was uh, ten thousand to six thousand years ago, it was a lot warmer than it is today. Um, and uh, there was no Sahara Desert. What is now the Sahara was covered with vegetation. Many animals, tropical animals, uh, more icy? among this vegetation, there were lots of there was lots of water. The same is true of um, the Arabian Peninsula, uh, and human beings um, lived there and hunted these animals uh, and drew pictures of them. Um, climate is like sex; if it's hot, it's wet, um, and. <laughs> Droughts always follow when you have cooling. Now this is this goes throughout the whole geological time of the Earth. Whenever it gets cooler, that's when you get droughts. All the hottest periods are the periods where essentially you have tropical rainforest everywhere, Cretaceous, times like that. So <clears throat> um, if you don't like droughts, uh, you should welcome a bit of global warmth. Uh, I, mean, I, I must say, um, there are certain ironies and paradoxes in this whole discussion. Um, one of them is that I would love to see the world temperature go up by several degrees, but I have, I'm absolutely certain it's not going to happen, or at least it's not going to happen for several million years, um, by which time I'll probably pass it away. Um, and um, so... That's one, that's one of the uh, ironies. Uh, I'm, I'm resigned to it getting cold. Um, and um, I, I hope that the, for the sake of humankind, I hope that the present warm spell lasts as long as possible and gets warmer. Uh, but I'm not optimistic. You know, um, as we descend into a new glaciation, which once it's set in will last for 100,000 years, as we descend to that slowly over the next few thousand years, in all probability it will be slow. Uh, we will see little upticks where the glaciers retreat for a couple of hundred years, where the sea level rises. Uh, and then the cooling will recommence and we will be headed down into uh, glaciation where this part of the world will be uninhabitable. You will have to live in the tropics. Um, so. <clears throat> Another irony of this whole situation is um, you listen to people in this country discuss global warming and what should be done about it. And there's a kind of air of unreality about this. Because nothing that this country does will make a dime's bit of difference to carbon emissions. This country could shut down everything, and the same for Western Europe. It's the industrialization of, Ch industrialization of China that is creating more and more, and India, and Brazil, but especially China. That's where the, the carbon emissions are, are coming from, in, uh, more and more, in huger and huger quantities. Um, and they're not going to shut down industrialization. The one thing that the ruling group in China knows is if they shut down industrialization, they're for it, as we say in the UK. Uh, they, they'll, they'll be swinging from the lampposts. Um, people in China know what a good life is, and they see it in Western Europe and North America, and they want it. And now they see it in Beijing, Shanghai. But they want it. Um, the people of the world want the benefits of modern industry. And they will get rid of any government that looks as though it's obstructing the path to that. 
And any government which starts attacking carbon emissions seriously is obstructing economic growth and an improvement of well-being for the majority of the world's population. That's what they're doing. So, <clears throat> uh, the point is, it's unreal. Because we're discussing this, and nothing the US government can do will make any difference. Nothing. Any appreciable difference. Because it's happening in China. It's not happening here. Well, it's happening here, but it's less and less happening here. It's more and more happening in China. Um, so, <clears throat> The one thing we do know for certain is if you close down industry here, you close down industry here. We know that. That's 100% certain. Uh, it's a tautology. Uh, we don't know that it will make any difference to... Uh, well, we know it's not going to make much difference to total carbon emissions in the world. <coughs> uh, so, uh, somebody mentioned the hockey stick. So I'd just like to briefly um, say something about the hockey stick. Uh, the hockey stick was something that Michael Mann and his friends came up with. That's your receipt. Um, and what they, 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 when you have a theory and you're in love with your theory, you try to make the facts fit your theory. This is not a criticism. This is what everybody does. It's, it, it's inevitable. Um, and what they realized, it was a big weakness of their theory that it couldn't explain the Little Ice Age and the medieval warm period. So they wanted to come up with a narrative where there was no medieval warm period and no Little Ice Age. Uh, and they did that. And so you have this hockey stick diagram where temperature was more or less the same throughout history. Well, the history of the last thousand years, which is all they looked at. And then it suddenly goes up like that. Now that looks like a hockey stick, right? Um, <coughs> What happened was that uh, a couple of Canadian engineers, uh, McIntyre and McKittrick, um, they uh, were st statistical experts and they analyzed the reasoning in, well, they, they started to analyze the reasoning in, uh, in the, the uh, Mann paper. Uh, and they found they couldn't get very far, so they asked Mann to give them the original code and data Man wouldn't do it, and then started grudgingly dribbling it out and, uh, in, a in a deceptive fashion. Um, no, it wasn't available. It still isn't available. It still is not available. Go and check. Um, and uh, what eventually happened was the U.S. Congress, the Senate, um, commissioned Wegman, uh, and other, Wegman just about the most illustrious statistician in the U.S., uh, and, a, and a few other uh, of his colleagues to, to investigate this. Now, <coughs> Wegman, <laughs> Wegman's report, yeah. it's online, you can read Wegman's report. I've uh, talked to many uh, catastrophists about this. And what they do is they start attacking Wegman. <laughs> this, it has nothing to do with Wegman's personality or character. Well, as far as I'm concerned, Wegman could um, rape a little boy every day and then broil him and eat him. Um, that does have nothing to do with it. Wegman's reasoning, the criticisms of the hockey stick paper by Mann et al. is laid out in Wegman's report. You know, there is a way to do principal components analysis. And Mann and his colleagues didn't get it right. They made, they made mistakes in the way they did it. And if you don't do those mistakes, you don't get the result. Um, <clears throat> and there are ways to test statistical analyses. One way is to feed in random numbers and see what happens. If the result you're looking for turns up when you feed in random numbers, it means your study's no good. The man, the man procedure, uh, if you feed in random numbers, it produces a hockey stick. Random numbers. Red noise, it's called. You feed that in, you get a hockey stick. In other words, what their method did, and I don't accuse, I, unlike Mark Stein, I don't accuse Mann of being a fraud. A fraud. I leave that to Mark Stein, who has now got a legal action going yeah. with, uh, with Mann. Yeah. Not the National Review, by the way. They dropped out. It's just Mark Stein. Um, <clears throat> but um, what I do say is that there are certain innovations in statistical technique in Mann's paper. Uh, and they, they, it turns out they're the wrong way to do it. Uh, it doesn't pass the test. Um, so, if you're interested in this, 
to, I urge you to go online, get the Wegman report, and read it, and read the arguments in the report. Forget about all the slanderous attacks on Wegman, which have come up since then, from these catastrophists, because they're irrelevant. It doesn't matter if Wegman's a thoroughly bad character. All that matters is, is the statistical reasoning correct? Now, <clears throat> the, the uh, IPCC produces an assessment report every six years. It has done up until 1913, 1914. They produced part one in one year, the, re the other parts in, in the subsequent year, but the first part is the one that really matters, that catches the headlines, and that supposedly represents the science, the climate science. <coughs> so, in the assessment report following Mann's paper, the hockey stick diagram appeared in that, on the cover of that report, uh, and it appeared no less than three times in the interior of that report, and in the press uh, conference to launch that report, the background to the uh, assembled uh, producers of this report was a giant diagram of the hockey stick. So the hockey stick was becoming over the next couple of years. It was becoming their hammer and sickle or their swastika of the catastrophist movement. It was everywhere. Now, six years later, there's no hockey stick diagram. And you see that they have moved away from it. It's been abandoned. Uh, the, 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 um, <clears throat> there's still people who defend it, I agree. There's still a little group of people who defend that. Uh, but uh, the great majority of catastrophists I'm talking about now will say, oh, that was unfortunate. Um, and um, so that's, that's what happened with the, with the hockey stick. Um, <clears throat> now, on freedom of speech, I see no reason why you shouldn't invite the Flat Earth Society to make a presentation here. I'd, I'd be in favour of it. I'd love and to I see it. no reason why you shouldn't have, um, invite someone who denies that there is any injurious effects from secondhand smoke to give a presentation here. I'd be in favour of it. Um, I wouldn't necessarily agree with those two presentations, but I would be in favour of giving them, uh, giving them the opportunity to speak. Um, and uh, that's, that goes for anybody. Um, <clears throat> now, um, I think there should be balance, and I think there have been many more pro-green presentations at this society over the past few years than there have been people like me. Right? So, uh, so it's not balanced yet. Until you bring me back another six times, then it will be balanced. Ah. <laughs> uh, but but um, I'm not asking for that. I will come back, but I won't speak about this topic. I've got many other important things to do, um, to talk about. Um, <clears throat> now, this idea of doubt, uh, I, I tried to get to this point. Um, I am not in any doubt that climate sensitivity is low. And therefore, catastrophism collapses. You have to understand it. This is a factual question. Is climate sensitivity high or is it low? It's a factual question. If you think that climate sensitivity is low, you have to abandon catastrophism. Uh, it's a, a matter of fact. It's not affected by what we think about it. It's, we have, if we want our beliefs to be true, as we all do, we have to adjust our beliefs to the facts. And that means finding out. That means discussing. That means analyzing. That means looking at the data. So, um, I'm, you know, um, I think that climate sensitivity is low, for, and I've given some of the reasons. Um, and uh, skeptical climate scientists have given many more elaborate reasons uh, in many papers. And as I, as I said, what you've got to look at when you look at the scientific literature here is not whether these people say they're catastrophes, but what their conclusions of each paper are. You know, most people, there, there are lots of people working in branches of science who understand that there are ideological zealots out there that they'd better not offend. They keep, so they keep their heads down until this lunacy blows over. Um, and uh, the, it's only an exceptional kind of person who really relishes public debate. Now, most scientists don't. They don't want that. They just want to uh, work away uh, and be able to make a living. Uh, doing what they do, what they've uh, been trained to do, and that's what happens. So, um, <clears throat> the 97% is totally made up. Um, basically, this is, the, this is why I emphasized at the beginning of my presentation that there is agreement on all these basic points. Uh, if you ask people, is there a greenhouse effect, 
or have humans affected the climate, you're asking questions which are meaningless, because everybody agrees with that. I'm amazed that you can't get more than 97% if you ask questions like that. Now, every few years, there is a guy, a climate scientist in Germany called Hans von Storch, S-T-O-R-C-H, who has done many horror <coughs> studies, you can, and you can get his reports. He did the, the latest, he does every few years, he does another one. He actually surveys climate scientists and asks them what they think. And it's, it basically is not a slam dunk in, a, in any direction. It's a very complicated range of views, which is what you would expect. Um, and you, you, you ask questions like, do you think... I mean, a lot, of the, a lot of the arguments for catastrophism come from models called global circulation models, which are fantastically complicated programs, systems of equations, basically, that, that you have to have a super, a super computer that costs billions of dollars to run them on. Ordinary academics in, in a department can't run these models. So, it requires too much computing power. And, and these models are bankrolled through the IPC and its affiliates. Uh, and they're horrendously expensive. And they all make the assumption that, that climate sensitivity is high. And they all fail to make correct predictions. They've been making dumb predictions that are too hot ever since they were begun. They've never once, they've never once got it right. Yeah. Um, and every six years for the IPCC, they start again, and they predict. And it's as though the previous IPCC, report, uh, IPCC reports never happened. Um, <coughs> so, um, uh, let me say something about the word denier. I do deny uh, catastrophism, but you know, um, if you believe something, you deny its negation. If you believe X, you deny not X. If you believe it not X, you deny X. So everybody is a denier. A denier, if you call someone a denier, you're just saying they don't agree with me. That's all you're saying. You're not saying anything more. So um, uh, that I deny this delusion simply means that I am on the side of the truth. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Close us up, Ram. Uh, Let's have one more round for our speaker, please. I want to thank you all for coming. Hope to see you soon. We have uh, fire schedules here on the table. Breathing? Um, yeah, it should be called carbon fiber. Breathing? Yeah. Oh, no, yeah, it's, 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 it